Okay. You guys see the slides and hear us? Yep. Okay. We're on track. Here we go. All right. So, Sermon on Mount, part two. Right. And I think we're going to have to add like another week, like I was saying before, um, because of just how our discussion is going. But anyway, let's always recap and make sure that uh, we're all on the same page. And so last week, just talked about uh, Sermon on Mount in general, that it spans three chapters from chapter five in Matthew, in Matthew chapter five, and it goes through uh, chapter seven. And and the sermon in its entirety serves as a moral roadmap for someone to follow Christ, right? That's what the sermon on Mount is. It was revolutionary um, for time and even uh, until today because what the Lord was giving us was timeless. He was teaching us timeless morals from the heavenly kingdom that we would use then for all of eternity, right? And as we're kind of building off of our um, last series, which was, you know, we ended it with talking about the new covenant, right? The whole point of the new covenant was to begin to cleanse us from the inside. The old covenant said, you know, fell short because you could only deal with the things on the outside. You couldn't clean us from the inside. And so Christ came, established a new covenant, and he was able to clean us from the inside. And now he was giving us a roadmap for our heart, right? How should our how should we live um you know from the inside out, right? And the beginning to the Sermon on the Mount is the Beatitudes, right? So the beginning um are these uh nine Beatitudes that we're gonna be covering throughout our series. And it was just the preface to everything that else everything else he would say in the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. But the big question is, what's a beatitude? Who remembers from last? What's a beatitude? What is what is beatitude like? The actual word. The takers. The beatitude, the actual word, means the supreme blessing. Supreme blessing, right? When we think about the word blessed, it comes from the Greek word makarios, and it was a, a word that was used to describe the happiness that gods would experience, right? So if we're thinking a like supreme blessedness, is the joy and happiness that God experiences. So our God is a triune God. So there's a happiness or a joy that is experienced between the two members of the Trinity. And, and, and the beatitude is really this understanding of I can partake of that happiness, right? And But that kind of puts us in a little bit of a, a challenging situation because we're like, okay, I don't experience any of that happiness. Everything around me and everything I'm experiencing falls way short than that happens. And it almost seems like, okay. are you serious? It's hard and it hurts to turn. It looks like this button. Right. Put this down and start. Um, so, the question becomes like, is it really possible for me to experience that when we live in a world that's this broken, right? And so uh shared this quote by St. Gregory of Nyssa, where he says, but as he who fasting man made him in the image of God in a derived sense, that which is called by his name should also be held blessed in as much as he participates in the true beatitude. So what St. Gregory is saying is that because we're made in the image and the likeness of God, right? Then logically, right, it makes sense that we have an ability or an opportunity to participate in that blessedness that exists 
is in the Trinity, right? And so the question now becomes, well, how do I participate in it? Right, so we know it's possible because I was made in his image and likeness. So there's a link between me and God. But now how do I begin to participate in that extreme like joy and happiness and, and blessing that exists in the tree? Yeah. So talked about two beatitudes last week. We said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What how did we quickly define or describe being poor in spirit? Lack of spirituality. A person without hope. The poor in spirit would be a person without hope. A person has no hope. How could they participate in being like joyful and, and, and kind of that uh, happiness that is experienced by God if there's no hope? Um again. <laughs> When, when you, and again, he was talking to them, he was telling them this for a reason, because they were going through so much trauma and so much persecution, and there was no hope at that time. They believed that the Messiah was going to come, mm -hmm. but they didn't ever see or believe that they would actually see him walk the earth. And so there was no hope at one time. There was hope, but then things happened down through the centuries that they people did lose hope at one time. Okay. They they didn't have hope, you're right, at a certain point, but then he came with that message of hope. When we're looking specifically at this blessing of the Holy Spirit, okay. The gateway, if you will, into entering into this blessing that exists between the Trinity would be to take on a characteristic mm -hmm. that exists there. And when we talk about poor in spirit, we equated it to humility. Right? That when we are when we are poor, okay, we took this idea of, of poverty, okay, and we said when we are poor, but we have poverty of sin, it's actually a good thing. Also we're saying in a double negative, right? Poverty of sin. And poverty of possessions, right? That we don't have much. What does that generally put somebody in a position to? It prepares us for a life of learning to rely on God, right? And to rely on God in all things takes a great deal of humility. It's to say that, like, I don't have the ability to do it, right? That you are greater, that you you know, and that you will provide. That I can't do it for myself. It is it is an act of humility. And we looked specifically and we said, okay, well, what's the standard of humility? How low do I kind of suppress myself in this labor of humility? And we looked at Christ as being a sin, right? He had the riches of the heavenly kingdom and he came down to live on earth. He was the judge of all judges and he came and he was judged here on earth and, and convicted um, in, a, in a bogus trial, right? So he was you know, didn't experience hunger and thirst, but then he came and he experienced hunger and thirst. So he humbled himself, right? So to be poor in spirit is to take on this mindset and this heart of humility, right? To be poor in spirit, meaning I need somebody else, right? So we also looked at blessed are those who mourn, right? For they shall be comforted. And we said that mourning, okay, that it can include those who are mourning something that was lost or or a loss of a loved one, right? That is a mourning that can be comforted. But to only take that definition of it means we're really looking at it through a narrow lens. Like somebody has to have lost something, right, in order to be sad and mourn. But we challenge ourselves to look at it in a different way, right? In, in mourning our sins, Right. But one of the ways that we mourn is we mourn over our sins as we pursue salvation, right? Which everybody is in that position that when we 
are pursuing our salvation, when we are pursuing the heavenly kingdom, we will reflect back and, and realize like, oh my gosh, look at all the different wrong things I've done. Look at all the sins that I've committed. And we would mourn that. And we looked at specifically 2 Corinthians, where it says, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So what St. Paul was saying in Corinthians is that there is a godly sorrow. And my godly sorrow is a is an act of repentance. Right? I'm sad about what I've done, but I also see the hope, as you're saying that, like I see the hope of where I'm going. Right? So there is this mourning that is happening in me as I pursue salvation. And yeah. those who mourn over their sins, they will be comforted because of the hope that they see. Go ahead. And then, and when the way we, I was taught, um, and what you're saying is right. When we when you say that, we was taught that once you repent, truly repent of your sin, you don't go back and do that sin no more. Mm -hmm. We all gonna sin, but that sin you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. We always need to be coming back from our sins. Right? Yes. The goal is to never go back, right? Even if we backslide. There's always mercy. Right? There's always hope. All right. So we'll go to our first two questions for this week. I want everybody to reflect on a time when you did something that you would soon after regret. No, but oh. soon after. <laughs> like, like, I got one. I got a lot of <laughs> I got plenty <laughs> of things that I did. I all right. That I did it mm -hmm. in the moment. And I'm like, oh. I'm going to live to regret that, and then we go on from regret, right? I want everybody to reflect, okay? And kind of hone in on a specific event or scenario or situation. Did something, like, ah, oh, I'm going to regret that. And then we went on to regret, okay? If anybody wants to share, you're welcome, but I know a question like that can be very personal, okay? But what I want us to do is think, okay, what played into your action that you ultimately regret? Okay. What were the factors kind of pushing you, controlling you, okay, that played into your response? Okay. The things that could come to mind are your emotions at the time, your thoughts, you know, circular thoughts um, that we tell ourselves and, and we just kind of feed the wheel, um, bad advice that we get from others. Like, those are just some examples. I will ask us to share what played into a bad decision. Not what the bad decision was, or what the bad action was, right? But what played into it? When you reflect on it. Asking questions like this because I always feel like I have to share. Do you know to share like something difficult? <laughs> but for sure, I think when I think of things that I really regret, it was primarily driven by unchecked anger. And I can get this like, like thought process just kind of like revved up of just like when I see this person I'm going to do this and I'm going to say this and I'm going to really show them like what it is and my like my anger that goes unchecked and my thoughts that I don't bring into the right? and those are the two 
Um, and I'm probably like ignoring good advice in the mix of those two, but but for me, it is I'm allowing my anger to go unchecked and, and my thoughts fueling my anger. And that's when I usually say something or do something that I can't work out. Um, I could think of two things, but the most what I could think of now was I lost a friend of mine, Miss Joyce, and he's living in the building. And I did something that I shouldn't have done. And I regret the consequences because that money that I spent was to be for the church. The tempers didn't happen. That I spent was the church money. And that's one of my biggest regrets. Mm -hmm. And I know that it was messed up that did it. But again, I I've been telling everybody, forgive me. And I'm not yeah. gonna ask the church to forgive me. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we, that's where I was poor. You were parent. And then you we share because when you share, somebody might be going through the same thing you're going through, and you can tell them how God bless you to get out of that situation. And so that's the way I was brought up the church. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of my biggest regrets as a Thank you, Dan. Does it like allow sin to take over? Mm. Wallowing in that. Wallowing in that. Mm. It's always my feelings that get out of control and just not me using my head enough or listening to what I should be listening to. But you know, the funny thing about it, and I've learned this, the first five words you hear that God speaking to you saying, don't do it. And then <laughs> can we come along and say, well, you just do this one time, God will forgive you. And then you dwell on it, and the more you meditate on it, and the more you lust after it, it'll come out. And then you'll be like, after you do it, you'll be like, and God don't forgive me, <laughs> you know, the shame. You know, kind of going off of that, I think the other question is to, to ask yourself, like, okay, you can go back and redo it, right? And you put yourself, you know, just before kind of committing the action, what would you do different to help you kind of relay those, you know, if you were knee jerk reactions or impulsive or passionate like responses to the situation? Again, and again, the voice of God would tell you is wrong but again like she said the lust comes in and sometimes the lust outweighs God's voice and then you give into it mm -hmm. and while you get while you actually doing whatever you do you still hear God's voice saying okay you messed up but get back up <laughs> don't don't stand that just, because again the devil gonna get up on you and let you know oh you messed up God don't, God don't care for you. You messed up. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have the attitude of repentance. Mm -hmm. okay. I, sorry, go ahead. I think you still need to like really regret anything because that's what I've learned. Mm -hmm. Like Sometimes we do need to learn the mm -hmm. hard way, you know, mm -hmm. to go forward. So I really, I don't, I don't like to say like I regret things mm -hmm. because not it's, really. it's shaped you who you've been. It definitely has. Mm -hmm. not, not, regret. Not, I'm not, not regret. Because if you regret stuff that you've done, you'll never get nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
there is a healthy side to it, though, right? Because it does make you think and reflect, right? So there is a healthy element to it. It's not something which is wrong. I think when I reflect on like my impulsive actions, like going back to redo some of them, I would just not hit send on certain emails or certain text messages, right? And I would even like draft them and just sleep on it, right? Um, I know what you're talking about. What? I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Or like, yeah. Or, or like, I have like thoughts that I want to share with somebody. I'm like, no, I need to just wait for these thoughts to just kind of simmer down and, and be distilled out into, you know, something that is like clear and not so impactful, right? Um, so that's what I always think about, like when I can go back and redo different things and like, don't hit send right away. <laughs> but you know, past even that, when, like you said, sometimes when you want to say something, you have to think about it. But sometimes about what you said right then and there, it's that individual, where we say things in love. True, true. We have to say things in love. True. You know, and, and it's not for every situation. It's, yeah, not, it's it, not a blanket like right. thing, but there's some things that we say we're like, "Ooh, we shouldn't say that." <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay. That was good. And especially, what... Pastor, if you know what you're saying is right, and the way you said to the individual, and you feel bad the way you said it to the individual, but you know it's right. And sometimes you to and say, well, I'm sorry. What I said was right, but the attitude was wrong. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's get started on our next beatitude. Thank you all for sharing. So we are in verse five. Okay, verse five. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Right. Now, remember, we're one of the things that he said is that the Beatitudes are not nine distinct like personality types or, or you know, scenarios, but rather they're a panoramic view of a disciple of Christ, right? So each one, like they, they overlap, they complement, and sometimes they build off one another, right? So we don't want to think of them as distinct, right? But, you know, each one has their own category. Because a disciple of Christ is going to will will be challenged in all of us, to grow in all of us. Right? So we say, "Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth." Coming off the heels of mourning, right? And and mourning in the understanding that we talked about that we're mourning and in, in, in over our sins as we walk towards Christ. Right? Meekness actually makes a lot of sense. Become meek. Right, because when we're mourning our sorrows as a part of the process of repentance, it gives light to an internal struggle that's happening. Right, and and the internal struggle is that I desire Christ and and His virtues, but I'm always being pulled back towards sin, right, towards my tendencies, towards these you know anchors, right, or or, or things that tether me down. And, and don't allow me to progress towards the virtue. So this is the constant battle that has happened. And as we're, 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 we're sharing, right, that each of us in our own ways has something that, like, okay, can overtake us, right, and that can overpower us and, and make us do things that we shouldn't do, mm -hmm. right? And... And when we talk about these things, one of the ways that we describe them are it, it's a passion, right? And, and passion in a negative sense. And what a passion can do is take a normal human emotion and begin to pervert it, right? So our passions, our tendencies, our evil desires can take normal human emotion that we all experience, but then pervert them. Let me give you an example, right? Anger is an emotion in and of itself. Anger is not bad, right? Because we can't have anger to be sin, and scriptures say 
right? God was angry. Right? So anger in itself can't be sinful. Right? We're told to be angry, but don't sin. But anger has an emotion, right? And it's in and of itself, it's not sinful. But when our passions get a hold of anger, it can do something bad. It can pervert the anger, right? So passions take anger, and then it allows my body to kind of deal with that negative energy in whatever way I want, whether it's yelling at somebody, you know. Thank you. Hello? Um, and so I can yell at my parents, I can disrespect my boss, I can gossip with my friend, right? All these different ways, right, are, are me trying to deal with anger, right? And I'm, I'm not dealing with, with my anger in a productive way. Give me another example. Loneliness, right? We can struggle with loneliness. And loneliness is something experienced by all. Christ said to his disciples, all of you are going to leave me. All of you are going to leave me alone. But how do we deal with this loneliness? Turn to the Father. Right? So loneliness, though, when left up to our passions, can lead us into toxic relations or addictive behaviors. Right? Or behaviors that are seeking approval. So our loneliness can drive us in, in certain ways. Loneliness can also if taken out of the hands of our passions, can bring us closer to Christ as we try and draw near to him, you know, in our time of loneliness. So when we look at these emotions that we experience, right, a lot of times in and of themselves, they're not sinful. But how we deal with them, how we manage them, can be safe, right? And life and God always have a way of teaching us tough lessons through these painful experiences. Right? And then we kind of reflected on that with our questions. And I'll give you examples. Like, you know, maybe you had a childhood friend that you, you know, while growing up knew that they had a bad temper. But decades later, you meet them and you're like, oh, something has changed. Your temper has been like curved. Right? You're not so hot headed. Probably fair to, you know, guess that. Their temper got the best of them. They did some dumb things. <laughs> that were the consequences. And now they've realized they're like, okay, if I'm going to really make it in life, I have to govern myself. Right? Or you can, you know, think of the person who is really arrogant in the workplace. Right? And that arrogance led to them getting fired. It's a tough situation. But now, kind of finding in the next job, what are they going to do? Take on a bit of humility. Because arrogance got them can, and I don't want to keep on looking for a job, right? So life has ways of teaching us. I always think like I, I give you my personal one. Growing up, I'd look at like parents who are in the in in the store with their kid in the cart. And the kid is just screaming. The kid is just screaming. And I was just like, come on now. Right? Like, why is your kid just screaming? Why are you just letting them scream? I was so judgmental. Till my kid is in the cart screaming. And we're walking through Target and they won't stop screaming. Right? And I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> all the times that I was like so judgmental of all the other parents who couldn't control their kids, but like walked out of the store holding their kid's hand and they're just screaming their head off. And I'm like, you are such a bad parent. Like, what are you doing to your kid? Like, I was that parent. Right? I'm now that parent. I'm like not getting you a toy. I don't care how much you scream. I don't care how much everybody's upset of it. I'm not like giving in, right? It was a humbling situation to be in, right? I'm a lot more graceful when I see other parents like struggling with their kids. Usually I walk by and be like, stay strong, right? Stay strong. Don't give in, right? But see these emotions that we have of like, it was judgmental and then there's a dose of humility, okay? And that dose of humility, right, helped me reel in 
my mind and my thought from being so judgmental. Okay? So we're talking about passion and anger and arrogance and judgment, all these things, right? They're not entirely gone from us. Even though like we have a humbling situation that really begins to challenge us in different ways, right? I'm arrogant. Does that mean like I go into my, I'm arrogant and I get fired? Does that mean I go into my next job and I don't struggle with arrogance? No, but I'm going to think twice about what I say and how it might come across. Is arrogance gone? No. But because of my experience, I'm going to try and control my arrogance a little bit different. Okay? And when we're talking about this control, right, what we're doing is talking about meekness. Okay? Because meekness is this control of our passions, right? It's this exercise of strength. And it's this exercise of strength that helps us control these natural passions or these tendencies that we have. Okay? And so let's look at this verse in Matthew 26. You have your Bible, Matthew 26, 51 through 52. I'll read it here. It says, and this is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he gets um as he gets arrested, okay, after praying all night. And it says, And behold, one of those who are with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? What's the example that the Lord is giving you know, Peter who did this? Right? What's the example that he said? He's saying, okay, this is an emotionally charged situation. Like we're feeling a lot of different things. Like we're scared. Right? Peter tried to flex his muscle, took the sword, cut off the ear. What good is that going to do? Nothing. Right? Gets him in trouble. The Lord Christ has unlimited power at his disposal. But what does he choose to do? He brings it in, right? And he exercises controlled strength. Okay? He shows us that even though I have power, right, the careless exercise of my power isn't a show of strength. And actually a true show of strength is to govern what I do. Govern my response. Okay? And that's me. Meekness helps us cultivate the spirit and the mind of moderation, bringing my passions into subjection. Right? It's not ignoring that I have these tendencies. It's not ignoring my anger. It's not ignoring the fact that I can be arrogant. It's not ignoring the fact that, okay, I, I have a bad temper. It's knowing it right? and saying, like, oh, if I let this go unchecked, and it took me down a road that is really bad. We begin to exercise, if you were like a, a bit of a higher brain function, say no. I need to govern how I spend my energy. Right? And when we really flex our muscles through anger or arrogance or being judgmental of somebody, we're, we're using strength in a very cavalier way. And actually, a very dangerous. But when you look at these tendencies, right, and begin to control them, right, we're exercising a different chemistry. We're exercising a different chemistry. So I'll give you an example. Right? We have eating habits, exercising, sleeping habits, like all these habits that we have, they're all linked, right? How we eat, how we exercise, how we sleep, all of them are important. Right, and some of us I like to eat, or I like to sleep, I don't like to exercise. Right, some of us, you know, we have different preferences. When you look at an athlete, right, an athlete, in order to reach their peak performance, has to govern what they, you know, how they sleep, what they eat, right, and and how they exercise. They have to govern it all. Can an athlete be like? I really just want to sleep in today. I'm tired. 
screen was puffed yesterday. Right? What did I have to do? Control the body. Right? Ugh. Worked hard. All I want is the Boston cream donut. What's the able to do? But I have to control factors. All these are important for them to perform at their optimal, you know, at, at their optimal function. And the same thing with us, right? We have to look at ourselves and say, like, okay, for me to be a true disciple, then I have to be mindful of where my coaches are. I have to bring them in. I have to be mindful of how my pride gets the best of me. How it may come out in public you know, forums. I have to be mindful of my tendency for a certain addiction or habit, right? And not put myself in those situations. Right? So we have to control ourselves. And this is the process of meekness. This is about exercising a strength that controls our passion. Any thoughts on meekness? All right, okay, let's jump to righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be free. Okay. Ever notice why scripture frequently places hunger and thirst together? You might think of another like verse in scripture, even if you paraphrase it, right? Where hunger and thirst are put together. Sorry, Abuna. Can you repeat what you said? Sorry, the question is, have you can you think of other places in scripture, right, where hunger and thirst are put together, right? Or are paired up? Because hunger and thirst come frequently together. Okay. And if you go if you go to John 6, uh, verse 35, John 6, 35, it says, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. Okay? John 6, 35. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Right? Hunger and thirst are put together. We see it in, in John 6, and we also see it in Matthew 5. Thus are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Why hunger and thirst together? I didn't think hunger and thirst are the body. Basic needs, right? It's so fundamental to our survival. Hunger and thirst, right? It's a fundamental human design. And hunger and thirst are essential drives for life. Because without hunger and thirst, there is no life. Life will cease. When when you look at somebody who is very like old or very sick, whether end stage cancer, chronic illnesses, or end stage HIV AIDS, right? One of the key indicators of, prog of, of their overall prognosis, even though it looks grim, right? One of the key indicators of their prognosis is their nutrition. Right? their nutrition, and their drug to eat. Because when they're sick and they lose that drive to eat, it's a bad situation. It's a bad situation. Right? So that basic drive is essential. Okay? And, and you know, I, I know how that is because I used to volunteer in a nursing home mm -hmm. with AIDS patients and they put the feeding tools in them, and then that's, again, they're not eating or drinking, so that they'll feed them through a tube. Yeah, 
And the tube is never as good nope. as, as eating normal. Yeah. Right? But when that drive to eat or drink goes, it's a really bad sign. All right, Mary? Let's go. Medicine hasn't changed that much since I left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So the drive, hunger and thirst, in itself, it, it's not bad, right? It's essential. We don't have it. There isn't money. Right? But what's the flip side? Right? So we're saying that hunger and thirst is good. It's essential for life. But is there a negative side? The dark side? Yeah. Exactly. Right? It can be harmful. Right? Because when we don't govern what we do, and when we're not aware of what we do, Right, and we give my body whatever it wants, right? Then it can begin to deteriorate. So hunger is needed for health, but hunger needs to be controlled because of health. Okay. So I need to be careful. So it becomes vitally important what I actually hunger and thirst for. Right. So what I hunger and thirst. For and what I pursue after is really important. Mm. All right. I want to read this verse from Haggai. And Haggai was uh, in the Old Testament, and this is after the exile. And in Haggai chapter one, um, after the exile, and they're coming back, and they're they're in the process of building the temple, right? And and the building of the temple was a disjointed process. Like they laid the foundation and then they got busy and kind of held up and, and, and different things. And, and so they never finished the temple, right? And so Haggai is the prophet at the time where they are really gearing up to finish the temple. And so he says this to, you know, the, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He says, now, therefore, thus says the Lord, I'm in verse five. And we'll read uh, 5 through 7. Haggai chapter 1, 5 through 7. It says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. What do you think the message to Haggai the prophet is to the people? To, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. That their lives are not fulfilled. Okay, that they're not fulfilled. But what do they, do? I agree with you, okay, but what do they do? Like, they have all this stuff. Okay, so, so they had this stuff. Like, what, what stuff? Give me an example. Yeah. Sorry? They're putting their hope in the wrong thing. Okay. Like what things are they putting their hope in? What things are they funneling their energy to? Material thing. Okay, so material. Right? You so much and you bring in little. You know, you eat, you know, but you don't you always feel like you're hungry. You don't eat enough, right? You drink, but you're never filled. Right, so you're pursuing after these things, and it's just like this endless cycle. It's never enough. Right, it's never enough. Never enough. Right, all the while, the temple sitting there, incomplete. Right, incomplete. So this is like, this is you know that that basic drive that he's talking about when we're saying like hunger and thirst, he's saying like okay, there is a hunger and thirst for physical food. But there's also like an element of fulfillment, fulfillment that we hunger and thirst for. And we can very easily get into the cycle of pursuing after material things, thinking that there is fulfillment at the end of it, only to find that we're empty. Right? This is the scenario that we're talking about. Right? Like the rich man and the poor man that died. Exactly. The rich man and the poor, the poor, the poor man. Okay. So now we have an idea of hunger and thirst. Okay, of what we're talking about. We're talking about this fundamental drive to live. It happens towards food, 
but it also happened towards things and material things that we want, like a great, a deeper sense of fulfillment. But okay, so then kind of the next question we have to wrestle with is okay, well, then what is righteous? We're saying hunger and thirst, we should you know have this basic drive for righteousness. What is righteousness? Live a life that is pleasing to God. Okay. And what does that life look like? Um, a life feeling to God is to help our fellow man. Okay. Um, to share his word of salvation with others. Okay. Um, just to live, just to live like the Bible says we're supposed to live. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? What is righteousness? What is righteousness? What are these words you're supposed to learn? Huh? Okay. State of being. Okay. And what would that state of being be? Like, we both kind of. Christ like. Okay. When we look at righteousness, we're talking about, you know, to put, to make things right, mm -hmm. right? To put it right, right? Or to cause. To be in a right relationship. All right. Another word that righteousness is often translated to is justice. Okay, so righteousness and justice can sometimes like depending on which version of the Bible, you might find, you know, blessed are the uh blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall be good. Right? In some versions, you might find, right? So righteousness and justice are are these two terms that are they're very closely linked, right? And we talk about you know righteousness is to put right with, and so when you're talking about what did Jesus do? Well, he made things right when he came, right? There was disease, and he healed disease. There was death, and he rose you know from the dead. There was injustices, and he spoke to those injustices. There was hunger, and he and he Bill, right? So he would make them things right. And he judged nobody. Huh? He judged nobody. And he judged nobody. He judged right? nobody. So, so he was causing them, he was making things right, and then causing them to be in a right relationship with God. Because what happened in their response to the things that he did? But they were pursuing after God. So he was like restoring that relationship, so to speak. But that's how you draw people in. You yeah. can't you draw people by your kindness. You have to meet their needs. Their needs. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, in order to speak to their hearts. Mm -hmm. Right? All right. And when we think of the word justice, right, it just brings in, it just kind of deepens our understanding of righteousness, right? We think of, you know, equity, you know, things being fair, uh, a just process, all these different things, right? Just as what comes into justice. But when we think about justice, one of the pitholes that we can find ourselves in is that you need to be in a place of authority in order to deliver justice, right? And if we think that way, we preclude ourselves from the blessing in pursuing righteousness or pursuing justice, okay? So let's begin to put these together. Right? We now have a better idea of what righteousness is or justice, okay? And now we're saying we need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. So we need to hunger and thirst for what Christ was doing. Okay? Let's go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and let's read 31 through 32. If somebody can read that, my voice is starting to go on. Uh, John 4, 31 through 34. Okay. 
Therefore, the disciples said to one another, Jesus asked, and my food is to do the will of him who sent me to teach you. All right, great. So this is what story anybody can place the story? Woman at the well, right? You met the woman, Samaritan woman at the well, and they had the whole conversation of like, you know, drinking from the living water, and she ran off and she was happy. Disciples were off getting food and they come back and they're like, Rabbi Eden, he's like, I'm I'm full. I had a good meal. And I'm like, what do you mean? We were getting the food and we left you with them. Right. So we kind of see this hunger and thirst for righteousness. There was a deep fulfillment that Christ was expressing as a result of restoring the Samaritan woman back into a right relationship with God. Right? There was fulfillment. There was joy. There was happiness. There. Okay. And if we also look at another verse to kind of complement this, um, it, it's just one one verse, First Timothy uh, chapter two, verse three and four. It says, "This is a good and accept. This is good and acceptable in the sight of of God our Savior, who desired all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth." Right. This is the, the desire of God to bring people back into a right relationship with. Him. And what the Beatitude is saying is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst to restore this, right? To bring, you know, bring this righteous action, okay? Or bring myself and others into this right relationship with God, right? That there is fulfillment. That is fantastic when we talk about it on a very, like, theoretical level. Like, yes. I love it. I'm all for it. Let's restore myself and everybody to this right relationship with God. Okay? We can agree with the theory. What happens with the application? It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> okay. It's hard. We like the theory, but the application is it's like, oh. Right? Why is it hard? Because you have so many temptations around you um, that you lose focus of what you really actually supposed to be doing. Okay. You get sidestepped. Okay. So we lose focus. Why else is that? Because we want to do it. We want to do it our way? Yeah. Okay. We want to do it our way. A bit of selfishness there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or a little bit of arrogance. Yeah. That's fine. What else? what else gets in our way? <laughs> the goal is to bring people back to God. They're like, oh, you got in the way. <laughs> we get in out. We get in the way. Okay, we get in the way. People get in the like when you say people get in the way. Like, yeah, what like, do you mean by that? The temptation of like the bad people. Okay, so we get like drawn off and 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 the Lord to not get influenced. Okay. Is it convenient? Mm -hmm. Right. This this ministry of righteousness mm -hmm. is it convenient and like on our schedule? And no, it's totally inconvenient. Mm -hmm. Right. Um. Is it a quick like, hey, I just talked to this person and they are in a perfect relationship with God? No. No. Don't work that way. It doesn't work at all. Mm -hmm. right? Such a slow process. Such a long process. Right? And oftentimes they're very frustrated. Right? So when we begin to think about all the barriers of what it is to hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? Great in theory. We love it. Blessing for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Practical right? application is necessary. Right? Practically living it out is messy. All the different things, right? We try and help somebody, they curse us, right? Had a good conversation with somebody, and then they backstep. We go go have the conversation again. I want to serve, but like, I'm so tired. Like, 
done a lot and I've been busy, like I don't want to do it. All these challenges to it. So what do we practically need in order to deal with all these challenges that get in the way of our pursuit of righteousness? Right. Okay, we definitely need prayer. Right. But man, I would love to pray. I need to pray. Do pray. Right? Pray. Pray, but like I haven't heard God, so like why am I gonna persevere? Still pray. And pray, right? Pray. I, I agree, like we need that. Okay, but in order to stand when I don't want, in order to know that I had a conversation with somebody, but it was a difficult conversation, and we're gonna have to have another conversation and another conversation in order to finally get right. Mm -hmm. What do I need? In those situations, okay, I need faith. What else? Do I, need? I need patience, suffering, long suffering. Long suffering. Okay, good okay, good community. What else? Do I need? You need a relationship with God. Okay, a relationship with God. All these things that we're talking about: patience, faithfulness. Long suffering, you know, um, endurance, perseverance, whatever. Okay. Fruits of the Spirit. We also can call them virtue. Well, the race is not won by the, the fastest run. You got to stay in the race. Takes endurance. Yeah, you got to stay yeah. in the race. Takes endurance. You have some pitfall. Patience, long suffering. Yeah. Kindness, goodness, gentleness, yeah. faithfulness, and stuff. Self control, right? the spirit. BBS, like it's still stuck in my brain, right? Right. But these are virtues, mm -hmm. right? These are the things that, if we want to hunger and thirst after righteousness, we're essentially hunger and thirsting after these virtues, mm -hmm. because the only way to reach this righteous living, take on these virtues. Mm -hmm. Who had all the virtues was Christ. Right. So in pursuing the virtues, in pursuing Christ, mm -hmm. and in pursuing the virtues that are found in the fullness of Christ, then comes the righteousness. But that's why when Thomas asked Jesus, he said, well, how, there was the way. He said, you know the way. Mm -hmm. Just look at the way I live, and you can follow me. Right. Yeah. So, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Mm -hmm is to essentially say, I'm hungry and thirsty for these virtues mm -hmm. that are essential for me to be righteous, yes. right? And that's where and the, the nice platitude of blessed are the hungry, those who hunger and thirst for okay. righteousness, right? They shall be filled. The practicality of it is when I pursue these virtues, I am fulfilled by them. And the fulfillment is real, right? I want to read this quote by St. Gregory. He says, the possessions of virtue, on the other hand, were it once firmly established, is neither circumscribed by time or limited by satiety. On the contrary, it always offers its disciples the ever fresh experience of the fullness of its own delight. Therefore, God, the word, promises to those who hunger and thirst for these that they shall be filled. And being filled, their desire will not be dulled, or rather, but rather kindled them. So what he's saying is that like when we pursue patience, right? There's a there's a deep satisfaction and fulfillment that comes with when we endure, right, with somebody, and we see like, okay. From this process of endurance, like, and, and from being long suffering, I see, like, okay, this individual launches, right? He steps into you know, this relationship with God that we have been working with. There's a fulfillment, mm -hmm. right? There's a satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Does it come overnight? No. It comes with being patient, it comes with being long suffering, it comes by endurance. And persevering, right? These virtues are what we need 
to live righteously. It's not going to come easily. But when we pursue them, we hunger and thirst for these virtues, that's when we find the same thing. That this verse is talking. Right? And we know the opposite. Right? We know that when we pursue after our desires, after our, our appetites, it's just like it's empty. Right? There's fulfillment and satisfaction for the moment, and the next moment it's gone. Right? So we got up the end in order to reach the same sinner. Versus, you know, the virtues, when we pursue after them, they give and they give hope. Right? And they don't like make us full, but they satisfy us and they kindle us for more. Right? They, they, they push us to go forward. Blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness. Right? Blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for these virtues. They're essential. For the righteousness. But you gotta have love in your heart. Not love, none of that works. Mm -hmm. But man, love is so practical. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Love is about patience. Yeah. Love is about kindness. Yeah. Love is about, you know, seeking the well being of somebody else. Mm -hmm. Love is practical. Mm -hmm. Right? The love is full of a whole bunch of other virtues. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah. there's a practical side to it. You know, I ride up and down and ride around and I see people and I say, okay, have a good day. And out of maybe 10 people, maybe one person might not speak back. Mm -hmm. But it don't cost nothing to speak. Yeah. It doesn't cost to say good morning. Yep, yeah. it doesn't. That we call it. But again, pride and people rushing all right, any questions? Five minutes over, and I only did two. Oh, guys, where is my like warning? Uh, <laughs> I don't have a clock that shows when I'm on the screen. Closing prayer. Name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and God, and Amen. Thank you for the blessing. Thank you for the stone. Ask you, Lord, that you continue to nourish us as we go through. The Beatitudes, Lord, and help us to see that each one of us uh, can be challenged in different ways. But when we take on the challenge and when we pursue after you, Lord, you reward us with a blessing inside. The joy that is experienced between all eternity. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to experience that joy. We ask the Lord that you would give us weakness and the hunger to pursue after the blessing. In the intercession of all your saints here, so as we say, our Father, who art in heaven, I will be thy name. Thank you, my friend. This is the day of our God, and we have our trespasses, and we have to bear our trespasses. Lead us not into temptation, and we shall be able to purchase our own kingdom, and the world of heaven. Good night, everybody. See you next week for the next video. Good night. Thank you.